Chapter 57 of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 57. On the Trials of Travel. When it was time for me to return to Naples from Bayi, I easily persuaded myself that a storm was raging, that I might avoid another trip by sea and yet the road was so deep in mud all the way that i may be thought none the less to have made a voyage on that day i had to endure the full fate of an athlete the anointing footnote i e an anointing with mud with which we began was followed by the sand sprinkle in the naples tunnel footnote a characteristic figure after anointing the wrestler was sprinkled with sand so that the opponent's hand might not slip the naples tunnel furnished a short cut to those who like seneca in this letter did not wish to take the time to travel by the shore route along the promontory of pausilipum and footnote no place could be longer than that prison nothing could be dimmer than those torches which enabled us not to see amid the darkness but to see the darkness but even supposing that there was light in the place the dust which is an oppressive and disagreeable thing even in the open air would destroy the light how much worse the dust is there where it rolls back upon itself and being shut in without ventilation blows back in the faces of those who set it going so we endured two inconveniences at the same time and they were diametrically different we struggled both with mud and with dust on the same road and on the same day the gloom however furnished me with some food for thought i felt a certain mental thrill and a transformation unaccompanied by fear due to the novelty and the unpleasantness of an unusual occurrence of course i am not speaking to you of myself at this point because i am far from being a perfect person or even a man of middling qualities i refer to one over whom fortune has lost her control even such a man's mind will be smitten with a thrill and he will change color for there are certain emotions my dear lucilius which no courage can avoid nature reminds courage how perishable a thing it is and so he will contract his brow when the prospect is forbidding he will shudder at sudden apparitions and will become dizzy when he stands at the edge of a high precipice and looks down this is not fear it is a natural feeling which reason cannot rout that is why certain brave men most willing to shed their own blood cannot bear to see the blood of others some persons collapse and faint at the sight of a freshly inflicted wound others are affected similarly on handling or viewing an old wound which is festering and others meet the sword stroke more readily than they see it dealt accordingly as i said i experienced a certain transformation though it could not be called confusion then at the first glimpse of restored daylight my good spirits returned without forethought or command and i began to muse and think how foolish we are to fear certain objects to a greater or less degree since all of them end in the same way for what difference does it make whether a watch-tower or a mountain crashes down upon us no difference at all you will find nevertheless there will be some men who fear the latter mishap to a greater degree though both accidents are equally deadly so true it is that fear looks not to the effect but to the cause of the effect do you suppose that i am now referring to the stoics who hold that the soul of a man crushed by a great weight cannot abide and is scattered forthwith because it has not had a free opportunity to depart that is not what i am doing those who think thus are in my opinion wrong just as fire cannot be crushed out since it will escape round the edges of the body which overwhelms it just as the air cannot be damaged by lashes and blows or even cut into but flows back about the object to which it gives place 
Similarly, the soul, which consists of the subtlest particles, cannot be arrested or destroyed inside the body, but, by virtue of its delicate substance, it will rather escape through the very object by which it is being crushed. Just as lightning, no matter how widely it strikes and flashes, makes its return through a narrow opening, so the soul, which is still subtler than fire, has a way of escape through any part of the body. We therefore come to this question, whether the soul can be immortal. But be sure of this, if the soul survives the body after the body is crushed, the soul can in no wise be crushed out, precisely because it does not perish. For the rule of immortality never admits of exceptions, and nothing can harm that which is everlasting. Farewell. End of chapter 57